And I'd like to start, we we'll consider this question, by asking you a question in the abstract, which is to say to separate the conditions from the case and to just consider it as a problem. If you were faced as a consultant, as, a, as an analyst, with the problem of a market, the principal feature of which was lack of information, persistent informational uncertainty, what would be your first response? What would be the logical response to solving that market dilemma, that market problem? What would you give the market? Information. information. You would look to give the market information. A market that doesn't have information is a market that needs information. It's begging for it. It's like, please give me some information. How do we give... So again, let's strip it from the case for a moment. So let's not worry about what the Romans did. Let's consider this instead as a problem that we want to face. Here's a market that has no information. We need to give it information. How do we give it information that it can use reliably? And I think the first thing to, to, to ask is, where does the information start in a market like this? Where does it start? Where's the first point of information? Market participants? People who Who's the market? first market participant, Marco? Uh, <laughs> the farmer. The farmer, right? The guy who puts the seed in the ground is the first market participant. Because if he doesn't put the seed in the ground, is there a market? No, because there's no grain. So it starts with, I mean, we're simplifying. We're creating a simplified structure here in terms of how we trace the information along. So the person who puts the seed in the ground is the person who has the first bit of information, right? Yes? But isn't there first a customer with a need to actually make the farmer think about producing that grain or putting that grain into the soil? Doesn't there have to be a need for nutrition or for food? Yeah, but we're asking a more sterile question about the way in which information moves along to fulfill the need, right? You see what I'm saying? Because in a basic level, if we want it to be in a very abstract way, where, when the market puts the seed in the ground to grow it, where's the demand? Yeah. At that basic level, who represents the demand? The so farmer himself, right? Or herself. Uh, right? So the market is simply, I need to eat, right? Because the farmer has worked out, if I don't eat, I die. That's a suboptimal outcome. So therefore, I decided not to die by growing some food. So the demand, you're right, the demand is there, but let's be, but in the, in the context of a sterile exercise, we're going to work the demand out. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So it starts then with the seed, the first market participant is the farmer in the ground. Right? And so the information is, is stored in that seed and remains then within the commodity, right? That's where the information resides. So if Dennis is our farmer, <coughs> When Mr. Borzuma puts this, the, the, group, the seed in the ground and tends it with that world famous <coughs> Borzuma care for grain and grows wonderful, bounteous grain and has a little extra, doesn't need to, to use it all to feed his own family. And Veronica, his neighbor who makes excellent shoes, is willing to engage in a transaction for Dennis's wheat in exchange for Veronica's shoes, and they engage in a transaction. What's the information, the informational environment that characterizes that transaction? Is it good or is it bad? Good or bad? Good, because, because they know each other, mm -hmm. and the, the transaction of information is really easy. And they, they, they see the quality of the product before trading. They can assess the quality of the product, they know each other, Veronica knows how much grain she thinks the shoes are worth. Dennis knows how much he's willing to give her for the shoes, right? Maybe they're not so good. They tend to wear out, right? They're more, they're more like uh, Manola Blotics, which is all about the look. They're not really practical for a farmer, etc. Who knows, whatever. Both agents, both participants in that transaction, bringing their own interests to bear, negotiating in a transactional environment. And when the transaction is completed, we assume that they have, it's an optimally efficient market because it's characterized by essentially perfect information, right? So, and what's happened then? When Veronica now has this grain, the grain carries with it the information that it needs to make the market work. Which is to say, Veronica knows how much she's had to exchange in order to receive it, so the grain is carrying with it that information. And if we simply moved it along the supply chain, if we imagine our market as it functioned, when Veronica, who's got her little uh, donkey and cart, and goes around to the, the dentists of this world and collects their surplus grain from them, and then she sells them on to people like Nikhil, who aggregates them, who sells them on to Guillermo, who has a granary, who sells them on to Emilio, who has another granary, who sells them on to Elia, 
who has some kind of a transportation company that sends it up the Nile, sells it up to Sandra, who takes it off the boat and puts it in the port of Alexandria, sells it on to Angel because he's the guy who can then send it on to Rome, sells it on to Juan because he's the guy who's in Rome, who can store it in the warehouse, etc., etc., and it finally arrives at Rushi's house at bread. <laughs> <laughs> You should like it. You're the only one who's being fed in this entire transaction. <laughs> <laughs> and, this is, and it is the lunch hour, so you know. Um, at every one of those moments of transactional exchange, right, the information that is being passed is good, right? I think we'd all agree. It's characterized by good information because the parties to the transaction are operating in the context of a locally efficient market. And so they know how much they need to pay in order to get the good, in order that they can in turn move it forward get enough profit to maintain their operation as viable, etc. Right? Would we agree that that's, in, in the context of this market problem, that that's the best way to give the information, give the market the information that it needs? Such that by the time Dennis's grain reaches Rushi's plate, all of the information that the market needs to function has been carried with the commodity up the supply chain so that the pricing, so the information about it is effective and thus you have a functioning market. Would we agree? Right, that carries the information very well. So what's the problem then? When Rushi actually goes to the bakery to buy his bread from the baker who will be... Zahra. So he goes to Zahra's bakery. There she's been up in the early morning baking her bread, making rolls, loaves, and Rushi goes to buy one. What's the problem that he encounters? What is the consequence of this market? There is no medium of exchange. So Rushi has no way of... There is a medium of exchange. We're going to monetize our market here. We're going to assume that the market is monetized. We used a barter example at the very beginning, okay. but beyond that now we've monetized our, our, local, our local market. Yes? Yes, I'm Marcus? Sorry. Yeah, no. I, I think Rushi has a problem that he doesn't know how much to pay for it, right? Well, he knows he has to pay what Zahra's asking. And she knows how much to charge because she bought it from... <coughs> Gabriel. Gabriel, who in turn bought it from Juan, who bought it from, is it, Brittany, etc., etc., <coughs> So the pricing is good. Zara knows how much she's had to pay for the, for the grain to bake it into bread, how much she then needs to charge to recoup her costs, make a little bit of profit, and so on. Keep running. Right. But it depends if everybody's telling the truth along the chain. But that should, that problem should take care of itself because we trade the product. But it's a locally efficient market, so if you're not telling the truth, that's fine. You'll just go get it from someplace else, right? In other words, if Dennis tries to sell you grain that's not really good because Dennis has been out there like shoveling some dirt into the sacks, right, and stuff like that, thinking, but you're wise, though. You're going to check and see. And it's like, Dennis, there's all this soil in your grain. I don't understand. Like, you know, I thought we had a relationship here. You're just like, you're killing me. You're busting me here, man. Right? So you're going to go and say, I'm going to find other people. I'm not going to go to Dennis anymore. I'm going to go to Marco. And Marcos. Wow, is that coincidental? <laughs> the Marquis are going to be the Marquis. Because <laughs> they, they're going to give you good grain. They're not going to be like Dennis, which with dirt and crap in there. So the market's operating locally efficiently, so this issue of like having to worry about what's going on should be taken care of simply by the mechanics of the market. Stefan? My problem is that instead of uh, one rush, there are one million rush, the system needs to organize uh, in a different way. Okay. Because in this way... But what if there aren't, but we don't, we're not at a million rush at the moment. We only have one. <laughs> we only have one. Right? The presence of a million presupposes already something else. Yes, sir. Isn't about the dilemma that it's cheaper for him to produce it himself? Uh, or to go to a different vendor to... Okay, to cheaper for, why, why is it cheaper for him to produce it himself? Because he can bypass many of the steps and, uh, to actually make, make bread himself. Yeah, I mean, I think in effect you're saying, I think what is the problem with that market, which is, what does it, what's the feature of that market? It's an entrepreneurial driven market, right? At each stage we have individual entrepreneurs who are engaging in uh, in, an informed transaction, and, then, and thereby moving the information along the supply chain. But the problem then was when, it gets to, when Rushi goes to buy it, what's built into the price of the good? All of those transaction costs, right? Huge series of transaction costs <coughs> to the point where Rushi would not be able to afford the bread that uh, Zara has baked. And so we don't have a functioning market. Right? That market won't exist because the transaction costs are simply too high. So that puts a natural constraint on the market. If the market needs information to function, it can only go so far as the transaction costs permit. And further than that, 
there is no market. Surely to move grain from upper Nile farmers in Egypt all the way to Rome would assume unacceptably high transaction costs because think of all the intermediaries <coughs> that we read about who need to be involved in that supply chain to get it into Rushi's hands. So it's not a functioning market. So when we try, so if we think about it in the abstract, we say, okay, we're going to give the market the information that it needs to function. We, bet, we end up back at the same place, which is market failure. Or no market, which means we don't have a million people living in Rome, well-fed with bread. <coughs> right? 